This morning's second reading comes from Philippians. And in it, Paul is telling his readers that you need to leave behind the, the life that you've lived and the things that you've done. You have to give up a, a known past, if you will, for an uncertain future. And, and the hope is that if we can be more like Christ, then hopefully we too may be able to obtain uh, God's grace and have everlasting life. So the reading comes from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, and it is called Pressing Toward the Goal. Not that I have already attained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature be of the same mind, and if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. <clears throat> God beyond all names, we long to be continually challenged, transformed, and renewed by your word. May we hear your voice as of life as we listen and draw closer to you. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Being a chaplain has lots of interesting experiences. I'm sure Connie, if she were here, and certainly Dave can tell you, there are things you come across, and John as well, I'm sorry, John, um, as a chaplain that you just aren't going to see anyplace else. And sometimes there's a message to be had in your, your experience as a chaplain. So I want to talk a little bit about an experience I had during my internship because I found it interesting that the way it unraveled and was laid in front of me might just have been a lesson that I was supposed to be learning. One Saturday um, in the afternoon, I was called to go to a, a room uh, because a patient's sister had requested the presence of a chaplain. And so if you're a chaplain, you're never quite sure what you're going to get when you walk into that room. Um, sometimes it's incredibly joyful, sometimes it's a little scary, or it could be outright sad. Unfortunately, in this case, it was outright sad. There was a gentleman laying in the bed. Um, he was in a coma. He was hooked to a ventilator. He had all kinds of lines and fluids running into his body. Um, there were all kinds of monitors surrounding him, clicking off and, and doing readings randomly as we talked. And sitting next to him was his sister. Now, the patient's name was Mike. And if you looked at Mike, he looked like he was maybe in his middle to late 60s. In reality, he was in his middle 40s. His face was ashen, his hair was gray, his belly was distended. He was dying from end-stage kidney and liver failure brought on by his alcoholism. And his sister said that Mike was scheduled the next day at 1 o'clock in the afternoon to be taken off life support. Um, I was not going to be there the next day. Um, and the sister and I started talking, and I said there would absolutely be a chaplain present. I would make sure that the next chaplain coming in would know that they needed to be here. Um, and she started talking about all of the challenges her brother had gone through. Um, he had had a good life. He was working. He had a business. He had children. He was married. And then the business failed and he couldn't seem to get a job. And if he had a job, he couldn't keep the job. And then he started drinking and 
his wife left him and divorced him, and the kids didn't want to be around him either. And no matter what Mike touched, it just seemed to fade and crumble and become a disaster. And the drinking kept taking its toll. And the sister said, you know, Mike was not a very religious person. He didn't go to church very often, if at all. And I'm not particularly religious myself. I'm spiritual. But Mike had a last request, and I'm asking you to fulfill it. And I said, what would Mike like? And the request was that we pray for God to forgive him of all of his mistakes and all of his sins. And I said, absolutely. And we did. We sat and we prayed. And in my heart, I knew God would forgive Mike. I was hoping in her heart she knew that. I always believe if, if, even if you're in a coma, you can hear, and hopefully Mike heard. And we prayed, and I left. And the next afternoon, they removed all of the life support, and he quietly passed away. You see, Mike had trouble turning the page. He couldn't turn the page on all of his problems, his past. He just kept leaving them fester and multiply and continue to direct the focus of his life. Paul is telling us, one thing I do know, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. We all make mistakes, and that's behind us. And if anybody had a dreadful past, let's be honest, it's Paul. I mean, my Lord, the man was a tax collector and he executed Christians. You can't have a worse past than Paul. And yet he is able to put that behind him and focus on the prize of the kingdom of God and focus so well that that's where he is heading. He is not going to let the baggage hold him back. He is not going to let it weigh him down. By his own admission, he is the chief among sinners. Now, he could have spent his whole life going, woe is me, yes, I believe in God, but, you know, I'm such a loser, and I killed all these people, and nothing much could have happened. But he didn't do that. And what does he accomplish in his lifetime? His writings and his preaching help establish the church in the early years of its existence. Many of us do the same thing. We all have pasts we would like to forget. We have pasts we would like nobody to know about. We all have a hidden secret someplace that is buried, and let's just leave it there. But the question is, how do we deal with that? Do we let ourselves be bound by that? Because, you know, God's forgiveness is complete. If God's forgiven all of our failures and our mistakes and our errors, then I think it's time that we forget them as well. Because sometimes the hardest person to forgive is yourself. And this is what Mike had. Mike could not forgive himself. He kept seeing himself as a continual loser. And because of that, he was frozen and could not move forward with his life. Now, what was interesting was not more than a week or two later, again on a Saturday, but in the evening, around 8 o'clock, there was a code blue to the ICU, intensive care unit. Code blue means there's a problem. Got down there as quickly as I could, and I walked into the room, and there are two safety officers, we call them policemen. There is... A man and a woman, I assume it is the patient's uh, father and and mother or some sort of relative. Um, There are a couple of nurses and in a bed, restrained in restraints, his arms and his legs, is a young man, and I mean late 20s, early 30s, Todd. And he is in the process of being intubated. They are putting a breathing tube down his throat, um, and they will put him into a coma. 
and the breathing machine will do the breathing for him. You see, Todd was brought in that morning at about 6 o'clock in the morning. He was found passed out in a park in Lombard. The ambulance brought him in, and when they took his blood and they checked it for alcohol, his level was 0 0.30. 0.08 is the limit in Illinois. He was three times over the limit in Illinois for being alcoholic. In fact, he was lucky to be alive. His blood levels were so high that alcohol poisoning should have killed him. More than 12 hours later, he was in the ICU and he was still drunk. And they had him in restraints and he broke through them. And when he broke through them, he took a nurse and shoved her up against the wall, tossed her against the wall, and then turned and spit in the eye of one of the nursing assistants. And of course, security was called. The doctor said, this is it. You never want to irritate the nurses in the ICU. Um, they intubated him for his safety and the safety of the staff. And he was going to be kept that way for many days until he had detoxed and could be safely taken out of that coma where he would not hurt anyone. I went outside in the hallway and learned that it was Todd's father and Todd's aunt. Um, and they were just horror stricken. And I said, you do understand why they're doing this? And they said, yes. And that this was not the first experience they had had. Todd seemed to have quite a problem with his drinking and they were running out of options of what to do with him. Because you see, Todd too seemed to be having trouble turning a page. For whatever was causing his excessive drinking, he could not put it past him. But unlike Mike, Todd still had the opportunity to change. The opportunity was there in front of him if he chose to do it, to accept that no matter what his current circumstances were, he could move on to better and greater things. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Todd just had to learn that he alone could not get past his problems, that he needed some help and that he did not have to be mired in whatever was causing him to drink that excessively. That's what Paul is telling us. He's telling us that his top priority in life is the kingdom of God, and he is running straight towards that goal, and nothing is going to distract him from it. And that's what Paul is telling us to do. Focus on God, focus on what we are called to be, and run to that goal. When I left, I spent four hours with the young person who had been spit in the eye because she was in the emergency room, and for a good four hours, we sat there and talked as she awaited the results of an HIV test because had he been HIV positive, she might have been infected. Fortunately, he was negative. But for four hours, a 19-year-old young lady was very, very nervous. Now, I'd love to tell you that we heard that Todd had turned the page, but I'm not quite sure. Because he was readmitted on Christmas Eve, once again intubated and sedated. And he was unwilling or unable to try and move forward, to recognize his problem, to put it behind him, and to move towards God. What are our priorities? Are we racing to God? Are we racing to the kingdom? Do you see the kingdom of God before you as your priority? Or is it something else? The house that needs to be clean the business that needs to be conducted, the trips or the boats that we want to buy or have. You see, we need to be like Paul. 
We need to put our priorities where they are. We shouldn't be like Todd. We shouldn't be held back because whatever it is that is our problem is holding us back and not allowing us to run forward. Strangely enough, one week later, Sunday morning this time, I get a call for a chaplain visit to a room. Once again, going in, not sure what I'm going to get. I walk in and sitting up in bed with uh, the nasal uh, tube in his, his nose is a man who's in about his 40s. He's bald. His hair is slicked back. Um, has like a, a goatee. Um, has the appearance of the stereotypical biker dude. You know, not your weekend motorcycle person, but you know, a, a guy who seriously rides his motorcycle. Uh, but very nice, very nice. His name's Don, and he's sitting there, and we start chit-chatting, and I asked what, what his medical issue was, and he said that he had been diagnosed with bronchitis and pneumonia, and he had early emphysema. And the doctors told him he needed to quit smoking. And he was a little concerned about that. And we talked about the difficulties and the challenges that that presents. And Don shared with me that he also was a recovering alcoholic and substance abuse person. So he had dealt with being alcoholic and a drug addict and had overcome that. At that time, a friend of Don's came into the room. His name was Matt. And Matt said he had stopped to see Don on the way back from a meeting. I can assume it was probably an AA meeting. Don told him about his diagnosis and the need to quit smoking, and he said he was really concerned about being able to give up smoking because he had fallen off uh, about 10 months ago on the, the alcohol trail. And he wasn't sure if he had the will and the ability to once more overcome yet another addiction. And Matt reminded Don he said, what did you do when you fell off 10 months ago? And Don said, I got right back in the program. He said, you're right, and you stopped drinking. Matt asked Don what the big book said. The big book, by the way, is not the Bible. If you are in those recovery programs, I believe the big book is the book like for Alcoholics Anonymous of Rules. And, and steps that you go through. It's the 12-step program. So we're not talking the Bible here. He said, what did the big book say? Don replied, turn our lives over to God. Interesting. Turn your life over to a higher power, to God. And Matt said, well... You know, it seems to me if you can lick alcohol and drug abuse, you should do pretty well licking smoking. And you know we're all there to help you do it. You can get over this. And Don kind of went, yeah, I think I probably can. And then Don talked about how he enjoyed reading the Bible. And he said, you know what my favorite passage is? And sweat started to break out um, on my hands and my face because my fear is someone's going to ask me to recite a verse from the Bible, which of course I will not know because I am not a biblical scholar, so just so you know. And he said, yes, I love Isaiah 41.10. I went, of course you do. <laughs> Having no clue what Isaiah was saying in 41.10. And I said, you know what, let me, let me open up a Bible and let me read that to you. <laughs> and so I found out what it said. And this is what 41.10 says. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That was Don's favorite Bible verse. That was his cornerstone upon which he held his faith in his challenges that he put behind him. It is that phrase or that verse, if you will, that will keep 
Don going through his continued recovery. Once again, I have no idea what happened to Don once they leave the hospital. I don't see them again unless they come back. Um, but I have to believe in my heart that Don was overcoming smoking, maybe not easily, maybe with some falling back into a bad habit and having to pick up and start over again. But for those of us who have dealt with those kinds of bad habits, we know how hard it is. But he knew that he could put it behind him. He knew that he needed God's help to do that. He had God's forgiveness, and he could move forward in his life. We sat in that room and we talked about how we live life, sometimes living one day at a time. They said sometimes they live one minute at a time in dealing with their abuse. But they focus on the goal and they know they have support and they can call for help whenever it's needed. I prayed with those gentlemen and I walked out of the room and has, has happened so many times when I've done chaplaincy, I wasn't sure who got pastoral care. I think I got the better end of it. They taught me so much and the best I had was a prayer. It's amazing what you can learn if you spend time with people. Focusing on our mistakes and our failures and our past just brings us to a paralysis of anguish and, and remorse and hatred of ourselves. God enables us to release those mistakes, forget those mistakes, make them, make them in your past. Erase the memories that paralyze you from moving forward. God surrounds us with his love and shouts, your past is forgiven. We need to hear that and echo it. I forgive myself. It was wrong. I will not do it again. It is in my past. I need to keep moving forward. Because from such redeeming grace, we find a peace that empowers us to have a future with all kinds of new possibilities that we haven't seen before. It is this encompassing reality of grace through the presence of Christ that we can forget the past, we can strain toward the future, that God gives to every single one of us and new opportunities that are presented and rolled in front of us every single day. I don't know about you, but I say let's put on our gym shoes and run to the goal that God has set for us. Amen and amen.